spring. I wasn't planning on calling you this early in the morning. I tried calling you before, but my battery went low. And then I was just going to wait till later today. But I can't sleep, man. It's like 6 o'clock in the morning. And I figured, I was hoping that I wouldn't wake you. Your voicemail would be on. But I can't sleep because, you know, as a creative person, when you do something and then you start thinking about it afterwards. Wait till you hear who we've got for you today. Wow, I am so excited. This is Vic Martino. He's an actor. He's a singer. He's... He's an entertainer extraordinaire. That's what he is. Vic, so nice to have you on the show. I'm so glad that you're here. Well, it's great to meet you, Mr. Rapism. Welcome to the neighborhood. Yeah. Last night's dinner? Yeah. What's up, man? I'm Vic. I'm Anthony, and this will be Okay, we're just doing a documentary about the day, but it used to be what it is now. Okay. Williamsburg, Brooklyn, 2015. It's trendy, and it's the place to be. Homeowners can't rent apartments fast enough to the now transient residents that occupy the area. But Williamsburg, Brooklyn wasn't always like this. At least not the Williamsburg, Brooklyn of this story, circa the 1970s. It was a very different place. It was a place you didn't walk down the streets after dark, and if you did, you had better have had some sort of weapon on you. It was the place I spent my childhood, I being Vittorio Guillermo Pachichi, Vito William Pachichi. <laughs> There's a mouthful. Later to be known as Vic Martino. Watch the fellow's name on second base. I'm not asking you who's on second. No, who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. <laughs> and we're not talking about him. How did we get on third base? You mentioned his name. I mentioned the third baseman's name. Who did I say was on third? No, who was on first? <laughs> Look, when the first baseman signs his contract, how does he sign it? Who? The guy on first. Who? The man on first. That's how he signs it. That's how who signs it? Yes. <laughs> Is this your usual coffee shop? Yeah, it's right next door to my house. I mean, now you got all coffee shops all around the neighborhood. One big coffee shop. Coffee shops and bars. So even the, even the president comes here for his coffee. I grew up living at 149 Angel Lee Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Uh, that's where I spent most of my childhood. This is where I grew up as a child before we moved to 85 out of my street. This is where I used to live. And I used to live right there on the second floor. On the right hand side here, those last two windows. Yeah, my friends, I had friends lived across the street, friends lived on top floor, friends all over the place. So this was the neighborhood I grew up in as a kid running around. How you doing? Good sir. Are you the super here? Yes, sir. Wow, we even got a superintendent here now. <laughs> we never had a superintendent back in those days. We didn't, we didn't need one then. <laughs> oh, yes, we did. <laughs> now I know what I'm going to say, and I'm saying it to myself over and over. Basically, this is why I can't sleep. It's like I'm saying lines, practicing my lines. Hold it right there. It was a cuckoo clock. All right, let's get back to our story with no further interruptions. My growing years were spent on 85 Hevemeyer Street. But this isn't so much a story about me as it is about some neighborhood people of the time. One of those neighborhood people was my mother, Rosie Bellucci, AKA Rosie Bull. She was the kind of person who would help anyone and most people that needed help came to see her. Uh, if you were having trouble with a landlord or any kind of personal problem, people went to see Rose, and Rose went to see some of her friends. And I'll get to them momentarily. What was your mom's name? Rose, Rosie Bellucci. They called her Rosie Bolt.
My mother had an older brother, Joseph Bellucci, a.k.a. Joe Bull. He was a good man with a good heart, but he was a tough bastard. Everyone respected Joe Bull, and that included, I guess, what one would call the neighborhood wise guys. One of my most vivid memories of my mother's brother was when I was looking out our uh, top floor apartment window and my mother was yelling at me about something. And I sort of got a little disrespectful towards her. Well, the next thing I know, I'm hanging out the window by my ankles, courtesy of Joe Bull. Needless to say, I never mouthed it off to my mother again when he was around. Okay, so this is 172 Angel East Street. Now, this is where I lived before we moved across the street to 149 Angel East Street. I used to live here. And I used to live at the top floor. As a matter of fact, that's where my Uncle Joseph, Joe Bull, right there, the second, the middle window, that's where he hung me out of the window by my ankles. I'll never forget that. Why did he hang out the window? Well, uh, I sort of disrespected my mother, but I never did that again, especially when he was around. Did he ever hang out the window again, or is that the only time? No, that was the only time. Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack when I was still very young. I'll never forget how my mother was overcome with grief over losing her older brother, Joseph. Unfortunately, you know, he passed on when I was still very young. I was like nine or ten years old. And I'll never forget the day he passed away. My mother got the phone call, and I was sleeping, and you heard, this is what I heard, Bull died! And I fell off the bed. Uh, yeah, he was a good man. I wish he had lived. The family would have been a lot closer had he lived. She also had a brother, Johnny, and a brother, Carmine, who they called Maxie. She also had an older sister, Jean, my Aunt Jean, who was happily married for years to Charles DeMarco, my Uncle Charlie. Her younger sister was Anna, my Aunt Anna. She was the light and love of my life. She also passed on early when I was in my late teens due to a weak heart. You see, in those days, there were no pacemakers or defibrillators. Okay, now, this is 569 Larmer Street. This is where my beloved Aunt Anna used to live. And I used to go to school a few blocks away at PS 132. They would send us home at 12 o'clock in the afternoon for lunch. And I'd come to my Aunt Anna's to have lunch. The noisy is just as noisy. The neighborhood's just as noisy now as it was then. And I would come to my Nana's for lunch. She didn't know how to cook, so she made what they used to call Swanson's TV dinners. And I'd have lunch here, then I'd go back to school at 1 o'clock. Then after school, I'd stay with her here until my mother came home from work. And you know, in retrospect, those are some of the best dinners I ever ate in my life with my Nana. Anyway, my mother, Rosie Bellucci, a.k.a. Rosie Bull, courtesy of her brother, Joe Bull, was married to a man named Emilio Martino. And they gave birth to my older brother, Michael. Michael Martino. Now, I don't know much about Emilio, as they never really spoke about him. All I know is he did some time in jail for being a bigamist. You see, while he was married to my mother, he was also married to someone else at the same time. My mother then met and married the man who was to be my father, John Pachichi. They called him Jake, although his birth certificate states his name was Jack. It was a turbulent marriage because my father was a heavy gambler and a womanizer. By the time I was six years old, they separated. One of my earliest memories of my father was when he would come to take me out for the day via the neighborhood Lama Street subway station. He would never come all the way up the subway station steps. He would have me come down the steps to meet him. You see, he didn't want anyone to see him in the neighborhood because of his gambling debts. Okay, now this is the Lama Street subway station where you get the G and the L trains. And my father used to meet me here to take me into Manhattan and we'd go to dinner and see a movie, whatever. But whenever he came to the neighborhood, he couldn't, he couldn't come up the subway steps because he owed the bookies, the loan sharks, he owed them money from his gambling debts. So I used to have to meet him down, down here. He'd be down here waiting for me. He would be right about here and not come up any further. You know, he would be like something like this, and he'd be like, come on, come on down. 
Hurry up! Hurry up! Get down here! If it wasn't for my mother, my father might not have been around any longer. You see, my mother had some very influential friends. Now, you might be wondering who they were. Well, some people might call them gangsters, some people might call them mobsters. But to me, they were just my mother's friends. It's going to be called Williamsburg, Brooklyn, then and now. Oh, okay. And my mother and her friends. One of those friends was James Napley, Jimmy Knapp. Oh, Jimmy Knapp, Jimmy Knapp, people oh, good. Jimmy Knapp's dead. Yeah. Jimmy Knapp? You know, well, the neighborhood. The neighborhood, my mother, Jimmy Knapp, every day. It's a combination of. A lot of changes in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. They would never recognize it today. Jimmy Knapp was like right around the corner. It's right around the corner. He was a capo, a boss, in the Vito Genovese family. Some might say crime family, I'll just say family. My mother and Jimmy go way back. She knew him a long time and worked for him for many years. As a matter of fact, if my mother wasn't a woman, she would have probably been a made man. I have this one vivid memory when I was younger of my mother telling me to stay out of her room and never to go into her closet and never to look in any one of those shoe boxes that were up there on the shelf. Well, of course, the next thing, you know, when she wasn't home, I go right into her room and I look into her closet and I look into the shoe boxes and what do I see? Guns, all sizes and shapes, guns. And I remember thinking, man, my mom is cool. Another memory I have is one day we were just, uh, you know, watching television or having dinner and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door and the cops come bursting in to take my mother away. Well, I went and grabbed the baseball bat and went to uh, clobber one of the cops, but my mother's, you know, the cop, of course, was like, hey, he was, and my mother's like, no, no, no. That's just my son, don't worry about it. But they were a little worried because I had a baseball bat in my hand to protect my mother. My mother wound up doing some time in Rikers Island, you know, a weekender. And from there on in, Rosie Bull became known as Rikers Island Rose. <clears throat> There's a place that I know where the wrongdoers go. Rikers Island, USA. <laughs> from 149 Angel Lee Street to 85 Hevemeyer Street, both located in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, circa mid to late 70s, Jimmy Knapp owned the building we moved in. We lived on the top floor, and underneath us was the Highway Lounge. Now, that was the place where all the neighborhood guys, aka wise guys, hung out. That was the meeting place. That was the place. The Highway Lounge was the place where Jimmy Knapp and his crew did their daily business. Okay, here we are now. This is uh, this is now the Commodore, and this used to be the Highway Lounge. Now, the place has changed a lot since then. For instance, this used to be where the bar used to be. The bar used to be here. And this is now a dining room. And the bar was in here. Okay, as we can see, this is the bar here at the Commodore. Pretty nice bar. Now the bar at the Highway Lounge wasn't here. It was in the other room. 
My mother was the barmaid, and uh, we lived upstairs. When the Highway Lounge closed down in 86, it was uh, a Dominican restaurant for a while. Then it was another Dominican restaurant. And then it was a place called Black Betty's, which was a very popular night spot at the time. And now it's the Commodore, which is a very popular night spot at the time. One thing about this neighborhood now, it doesn't lack bars, that's for sure. Plenty of bars. If you want a drink, come to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. <laughs> There's plenty to drink here. Speaking of drinking, I feel like having some Jack Daniels. I don't know if anybody's looking at <laughs> Now his crew is, you know, they had these nicknames. They didn't like to really use real names. And they had names like, you know, the obvious, like Lefty. And then there was Chopper. No, it's not what you think. He ran a chop shop. And there was Ski Ball and Hawaiian Eye. One of my favorites was Mixed Up Junior. He was a mathematical genius. He was really good at counting money. But the only thing is you had to be really very quiet because if you made any kind of noise, he would yell out, hey, you're getting me all mixed up. And that's how he became Mixed Up Junior. Then there was Sally Vigorigo. He used to sit right in front of the window of the highway lounge and sort of like a lookout and check everyone out that was in the neighborhood. And if he saw somebody that didn't live there or didn't belong there, he was like, hey, who's that guy? Who's that guy? Who's that fucking guy? What's he doing here? Where's he from? And then there was Sally's brother, Freddie Vigorigo. Freddie managed a very popular rock group at the time. Cool in the gang. Well, there was a point in time where Cool and the Gang decided they wanted to get new management. It wasn't a good idea. They approached Freddie with that thought, and Freddie's response was to, uh, well, to take the leader, Cool, aside and point a gun in his head and say, how would you like I shoot your fucking afro right off your fucking head? Afros were in style then, and, and you see these guys, they had a particular way of dealing with problems. Now, back to the Highway Lounge. As I said, that was the place where Jimmy Napin's crew did their daily business. I remember when people would come to see Jimmy. Well, he would never really talk business inside because of the saying, the walls have ears. So he would go outside with whom, whoever he had to speak with and walk up and down from one corner to the next, back and forth, until business was discussed. And then he would come back inside. And if he had to discuss business with someone else, he would repeat the same routine over and over again. Just take a walk from one corner to the next until they finished their discussion. And then they would come back inside. And my mother Rose was the one behind the bar and she would have their drinks ready for them. During the day, the highway lounge functioned as a business meeting place when Jimmy was there. Then in the evening, Jimmy would leave there and stop at Creasy's, a neighborhood restaurant before heading home. In the evening, it was usually one of Jimmy's sons, Lefty or Tony or Rocco, or all three, who would be there, and then it would more or less become party time. This was on Tony Knapp and the Gambling Gang. The car to our next for the dealer, you will look at your very car. If it's not a picture car or an ace, there's no reason for you to look at it. What with legalized gambling about to spread to these ports, there'll be a great demand for croupiers, stick men, and blackjack dealers with fast hands. Where do you find them? Well, you'd never think it, but behind these windows in the late Pete McGinnis' Brooklyn section of Green Perk, as he pronounced it, is a gambling school. Not to be confused, please, with a gambling joint. Tony Napoli runs the joint house school, the same Tony Napoli whose 26 dealers were locked up over the weekend on charges of running an illegal operation during a Las Vegas night at a nearby nice of Columbus in Brooklyn. And all the equipment confiscated by the cops belonged to Tony Napoli. That's why this school is stripped of paraphernalia so necessary on a first-rate class. So Tony Napoli improvised as a fits and top-notch teacher. It was the place to hang out, and not so much for business, but to have a good time. My mother wasn't usually there then. She was mostly there when Jimmy was there. But there were times when I was there in the evening, and well, I have some fond memories. So Vic, you used to be a singer? Oh yeah, I used to sing for a while there throughout the 90s. Uh, I sang in a lot of the New York nightclubs, which there used to be many at the time. It's kind of the tail end. By the 
21st century, you know, the year 2000, a lot of them are gone. But yeah, I used to sing there in New York and Manhattan and uh, Atlantic City and Las Vegas and Laughlin, Nevada. I used to sing what you used to call the, uh, you know, American standards from the American Songbook, like Frank Sinatra, D. Martin, Bobby Darren, a lot of those type of singers. You think you can give us a little sample right now? Well, let's see. <clears throat> As long as I'm singing, there's a bell up in my brain keeps ringing, making a crazy ding dong. And if the band don't desert me, there's nothing on this earth that can hurt me. Long as I'm singing my song, because making music means more to me than a pleasure. Me and music, we go together like notes in a measure as long as I'm singing. The world's all right and everything's swinging, long as I'm singing my song. Thank you, thank you. I'll be here all week. Vic is a special human being in, in, a, in a lot of different senses. His, his sensibility to a film and the people he looks up to are different from my generation. So the way he comes out of at an angle and, and things with a story is, it's just different than I'm used to, and and it makes me appreciate. You know, I don't like calling him an elder, but he's an elder to me. So I like listening to elder, other people's stories. So he started telling me all these little bits and pieces of these stories, and I'm a writer and a musician, and I write songs, and I just thought there were so many good little stories. And I asked him, you know, can I start to write some of these stories down? And I literally took them and jotted down a bunch of notes. And then I slowly just, you know, reintroduced his own life to him. to the Highway Lounge, all the best, Frank Sinatra, 1977. Here we are, this is 85 on my street. Oh, who's that? <laughs> so that growing up, you were kind of around a lot of um, outlaw figures people who are maybe on the wrong side of the law. Yeah, you could put it that way. Uh, did you yourself personally ever have any run-ins? With the law? Well, yeah, any run-ins with uh, the long arm of the law? With John, well, uh, John actually, <laughs> yeah, I did one time. I was on the West Coast. Here you go, Joey. Bigger than last week's. Hey, Crystal, the room is empty. Come on, time is money. Thanks. Phil will be very happy. Yeah, send him and John my best, huh? Good night, Heather. Good night, Les. Here's something new. <laughs> Never had these in the old days. They would have been stolen. I was crossing the street there, and I remember a cop stops me and writes out a jaywalking ticket. Now I'm from New York. I'm like, jaywalking? So anyway, I forgot about it. I don't know. Weeks, months went by. Now I'm driving on the highway, uh, well, they call the freeway out there. and. Uh, Cop stops, he pulls me over, I don't know, I was speeding, I ran through a red light, whatever. And then he comes back and he says to me, uh, you got a warrant for your arrest. I'm like, what? And he takes, puts me in handcuffs, takes me, and <laughs> it turns out the jaywalking ticket turned into a warrant, right? So I'm in the jail cell, you know, wait to see the judge or whatever it is. And some guy, some guy from a Mexican street guy comes up to me and goes, hey man, what you in for? I said, I got a jaywalking ticket. He said, oh man, this guy got a jaywalking ticket, man. So I'm like, oh, oh Christ. So the next guy says, hey, what are you in for? Uh, attempted murder. You know, so, yeah, that basically, that was my only 
brush with the law because that kind of lifestyle wasn't for me, you know? I mean, at that, especially at that time, I considered myself somewhat of a ladies' man. Ain't no pussy in prison. All right, right. Oh, now you're being a hammer. Now you don't want to leave. Yo, Craig Friedman, where you at? Yo, Craig Friedman, put down that pot pipe. Put that, put that pot away, Craig Friedman, and get to work. All right, we are now in front of what used to be Creasy's Restaurant, right here on Larmer and Concierge Street. It's no longer Creasy's, it's now Brooklyn Star. But this used to be the restaurant where Jimmy Knapp used to come and eat almost nightly after he used to leave the highway lounge and come here for dinner. Because at that point in time, his, his first wife, his, you know, nice Italian wife was no longer around. She, did, she was deceased and Jimmy was married to a showgirl named Jeannie. And well, one of her, Jeannie's assets was not her cooking. So Jimmy would be eating here nightly. And this spot here, in front of Creasy's, right here, this is the famous or infamous spot where Jimmy Knapp gave his son Tony the beating of his life. I mean, literally, he beat the living daylights out of him. And this was the spot where it happened. And it was the talk of the neighborhood for for years. Was that was it during business hours? Did Jimmy interrupt his dinner to, cut, to be the son, or? Yeah, I don't remember exactly. Like I didn't witness it. I just heard about it, and I don't know what it was about. I, Tony did something that really upset him. What time would pick up in the morning? Eight thirty. You got it. Watch it. the morte. You know what that is? Kiss of death. Which one did they kiss? Jimmy Napoli was the one. Nitti, Volpe, and the Andy. They sent Jimmy Napoli. Who's Jimmy Napoli? From Brooklyn, the torpedo. In 1986, the FBI came down hard on Jimmy and his crew. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, or as we call them, forever bothering Italians. They attempted to seize all of Jimmy's assets, but before they could, Jimmy sold the highway lounge and the place where I spent most of my growing up years, 85 Heathermeyer Street. He sold them both for a song, as the saying goes. He had no choice. They were really coming down hard on Jimmy and his crew. I guess the walls had ears after all. What do you do for a living, Bill Bixby? I drive a forklift. Oh, I didn't realize they were giving great legal training to forklift drivers these days. Hey, Tom, you don't need a lawyer. Not with Bill Bixby, attorney at forklift over here. I know enough. Yeah, I'll bet you do. Look, Tom, I'm not trying to shake you down here or anything. I just want some background. We find a woman dead at home without any bruises. We figure it's something fairly innocuous, like a heart attack or an allergic reaction to something. Okay. But when a mother's telling me you're making these cryptic threats about being rid of her, and then suddenly you're rid of her, I'd be remiss in my duties if I didn't ask. But you want to see a lawyer? Go see a lawyer. In 1988, Jimmy Knapp was indicted for conspiracy to murder. The murder victim was to be another capo of another crime family, and he was named John Gotti. Yes, the John Gotti, who was much more high profile than Jimmy was. Jimmy's style was to be as low profile as possible. Anyway, the FBI wanted Gotti for themselves. In 1992, James Jimmy Knapp Napoli passed away. It was surely the end of an era. <laughs> hey mama, don't you treat me wrong. Come and love your daddy all night long, all right. Hey, hey, <laughs> tell me what I say right now. Tell me what I say. <laughs> That's what I say. Good night, everybody. It's been a great crowd. I love you. Uh, 
Uh, so, Vic, tell us a little bit more about some of your family members, like your aunt Jean and your uncle Charlie. Oh, yeah, my aunt Jean and uncle Charlie. Well, they used to live in Queens on Parsons Boulevard. And I was a kid, and my mother used to take me to their house. I used to love going there because they had a color television. Not many people had a color television in those days. It was too expensive. And they had a cuckoo clock and a talking minor bird named Joy. Hello! Hello! My uncle used to try to get it to say something else. And all he did was say hello. And uh, my uncle was like, you stupid bird. But yeah, I used to love going there. And they had two sons, my cousin Anthony and my cousin Sammy. And uh, yeah, at some point in, in 1978, my uncle Charlie was diagnosed with lung cancer. And my Aunt Jean, uh, who had been ill, she actually passed away before he did. And I firmly believe she just didn't want to see him pass away. And she passed away before he did. Then a year later in 79, my Uncle Charlie passed away. Not only my Uncle Charlie died of lung cancer, my father in 2004 got lung cancer and my brother Michael in 2009 passed away from lung cancer. And they were all heavy smokers. So I want to tell all you people out there who smoke, stop. Okay, here we are at the famous Balmonte's restaurant. This has been here for years. A staple in the neighborhood, just like Crescis was, but Crescis sold the place. This is still here, and this is where uh, Jimmy's son, Lefty, Lefty Knapp, used to hang out. After Jimmy passed away in 1986, he wanted to find Lefty, he was here. He might still be here. So, I'm gonna treat the crew to dinner here, and we're gonna walk in, follow me with the camera. They might tell us to shut it, but that's okay. Because I wanna get, if anybody's in there that I know, I want to get their reaction when I tell them who I am. Ready? Let's go. And if we can't shoot there, we'll at least get a good meal out of it. They already looked out the window. Oh, I know. I saw some guy there. Come on. Now, don't worry. I'll make sure you don't get the camera broken. Hey, hi there, everyone. I will. I will. Please. Hey. Hi. How are we doing? We came here for dinner, but I'm also doing a documentary about the neighborhood. So I had to get, you know, Belmontes. Thank you. Yeah. We'll shut it when we're gonna eat. We're gonna buy something to eat, so don't worry. All right, come in. Okay, we're not so just like even take it over. If you don't want to. Just no, no, we're gonna. We're definitely gonna have dinner. Grab all you want. We're definitely gonna have dinner here. This is the dining room. See, I still carry weight in the neighborhood. Anyway, this is the dining room. Let's get get a seat. Can we sit anywhere? Or we gotta have reserve seats. You got a reservation? Yeah. Uh, Yes. Paul, you got the reservation? Yeah, yeah, I called yesterday at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> Anywhere you in that Talk to a guy who talked to a guy and said, <laughs> I'm waiting to hear what Johnny Zulu has to say after his beloved Montreal Canadiens are eliminated. I bet you blames it on Doug Wickenizer. Wickenizer? He's been out of hockey for 10 years. What the fuck is he talking about? Not to Johnny Zulu. To him, the Wickenizer pick will haunt the Canadiens forever. The fuck does a guy like Johnny Zulu know about hockey? Your honesty and forthrightness is compelling, sir. I'll tell you what.
I realize you're drunken in mourning. I won't bother you anymore. I'm going to leave now. But I'll be back. And don't you go anywhere. Because if you do, I'll put an APB out on you. I have to be in Dallas on uh, Tuesday on business. Cancel it. You should be at the funeral anyway. Maybe you and Bill Bixby could get a couple of more strippers. You know, those things could be pretty dreary. For the record, you know, I loved my wife. That doesn't seem like a very exclusive club now, does it? used to be was it here or here but this either this space or this space I think it was this space it used to be an Italian restaurant called Santa Lucia's and right here next door a couple of doors away it's now the Metropolitan Bar this used to be a place called Milo's an Italian, another Italian restaurant couldn't have enough Italian restaurants in a Italian neighborhood although our mothers made the best food so none of us real Italians ate at a Italian restaurant but anyway man. This used to be Milo's. As a matter of fact, at one point in time, if you walked in, you, you saw bullet holes in the ceiling. Now it's a, it's actually a gay bar now. It's called the Metropolitan. And this place is always packed at night, on the weekends especially. Nobody's in there right now. Now, a couple blocks down is the neighborhood I grew up in. I grew up uh, on Ainsley Street here. Over there we got South Pizzeria. That's been here forever. That's been here since I was a kid. Another pizzeria two blocks away, San Marcos. That's been here since I was a kid. And across the street there, you got the famous Giglio Boys. We should get a good shot of them. The Giglio boys, they are the guys in charge of the Giglio, which is part of the Lady Mont Carmel feast here in the neighborhood, and they lift a statue called the Giglio, and they lift the statue on their shoulders, and uh, those are the Giglio boys, and they, they keep a lot of the old-time tradition alive in the neighborhood. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice the pole. It's painted the, cover, the colors of the Italian flag. That's courtesy of the Giglio boys. And as you cross the street, you'll see this other pole painted courtesy of, <laughs> painted the colors of the Italian flag. Courtesy of the Giglio boys. And same thing here. Every pole on this block, here the Johnny pump, the fire hydrant. <laughs> what did you call it? Johnny pump? Yeah, we uh, fire hydrants, we used to call it Johnny pumps. Old habits die hard. I'm still calling it a giant pump. See this photo here? Now this is a photo taken around 1977. As I said, this is at Michael Johnny's house in West Babylon, Long Island. Circa 77. And this picture I posted on Facebook. And this brought the Bellucci and the DeMarco families together again. That's one of the good things about being on Facebook. Cool. A few years later, in 1997, Mama Rose passed away. I'll never forget that day. December 7th, a date for me that will live in infamy, like Pearl Harbor. As far as I'm concerned, that year we lost three great women, three great ladies. Princess Diana, Mother Teresa, Mother Rose. She was preparing. She was preparing the tomato sauce 
or as we called it, gravy, for our traditional Sunday dinner. My brother Michael and I were there as usual. All of a sudden, she had a breathing attack and couldn't breathe. Michael told her to lie down. I escorted her into the bedroom and placed her on the bed. I knew I was never going to see her alive again. I told her how much I loved her. I hope she heard me. I told her how much I loved her and kissed her. And then she was gone. Mama Rose was gone. Her funeral, her funeral looked like a scene out of The Godfather. They were all there to pay their respects. At one point, Jimmy's son Tony appeared, but he would not go near the coffin. He said he would rather remember my mother the way she was, full of life. At another point during the funeral, Jimmy's son Lefty approached my brother and me and asked what we planned on doing for her burial. When we informed him that we were going to have her cremated due to lack of funds, Lefty then walked over to some of the guys there and then came back and informed my brother and me that she was to be buried in a plot at Calvary Cemetery where most of her family was also buried and it was to be a family plot with room for my brother Michael and myself when our time came. We couldn't thank him enough. So that was my story of my mother Rose and some of her friends. I only saw them at their best. I only saw their good side. They were friends and they were family. And that's how I'll always remember them. What do you give to the woman who has given all her life and love to you? What do you give to the reason you are living? I could window shop the world before I'm through and nothing would be good enough for you, Mama, a rainbow. Mama, a rainbow. Mama, the sunshine. Mama, the moon to wear. That's not good enough. No, not good enough. Not for Mama, Mama, a palace, diamonds like doorknobs, mountains of gold to spare. That's not rich enough, no, not rich enough, not for Mama, Mama, lifetime. Crowded with laughter, that's not long enough. No, not long enough. What can I give you that I can give you? What will your present be? Mama young and beautiful, always young. And beautiful, that's the mama I'll always see. That's the mama with love from me. That's the mama with love 
from me. I miss you, Mama. But I still remember him to this day as a giant of a man, like Paul Bunyan. And like Paul Bunyan, he's become a legend. There's some great stories about Joe Bull. I remember my Nana told me a story of the time he was working as a bouncer in a nightclub in Manhattan. And while he was working, he sees this pimp beating up, smacking around his whore, you know, beating her real bad. Joe Bull would have none of it. He went over, literally, beat the crap out of the pimp. The pimp wound up crapping his pants. Actually, he pissed his pants. My Nana told me that the pimp was wearing like a, a, a velvet suit, you know? And everybody that was watching, because you know a crowd gathered around, they saw the pimp piss his pants, literally. And everybody was like, ah, oh, the pimp pissed his pants. And he ran, the pimp ran away, never to be seen again. I think he wound up in Jersey somewhere. Anyway, Bull, my Uncle Bull, Joe Bull took the girl, took her to a diner, he bought her something to eat. He talked her into going home. And he even gave her the money to go back to Missouri or wherever she came from. That's the kind of guy he was. Now, my Uncle Johnny's wife, my Aunt Louise, told me a story at the time. My mother and her sisters were great singers. My mother used to sing around the house in Italian while she was, you know, uh, cleaning, the, cleaning the house or cooking. And she used to, I remember her singing to Jimmy Roselli records. That's an old Italian singer. And my nana in particular had a beautiful voice. I remember her, when I was a kid, she sang on a tape recorder and she sang a sad song, so sad, with such feeling that I started crying. And she had to switch it up and make it a happy song so that I would, you know, be in a happy mood. She didn't want to see me crying. I, I wish I had those tapes of her singing. She had a great voice. Anyway, my Aunt Jean also had a great voice, had a beautiful singing voice. And she actually got a job professionally, uh, singing professionally in a nightclub. Well. When my Uncle Bull heard about this, he didn't want her in that environment. So the night of her debut, he comes barging in the nightclub. While she's singing on stage, he goes up on stage, picks her up over his shoulder, takes her out of the nightclub and takes her home. Now, I know that might sound cruel, but he was just very protective, maybe overprotective of his family, especially his sisters. You know, my mother and her youngest brother, my Uncle Johnny, they were so close until the very end. I mean, I remember growing up, going to my Uncle Johnny's house in West Babylon, Long Island, visiting him and his family. And my Uncle Johnny used to always come to my mother's place, visit her until the end, until she passed away in 97. And he passed away a year later in 98. And then there was the older brother, of course, Uncle Joseph, Joe Bull, but there was also a middle brother. His name was Carmine, and they called him Maxie. I remember him vaguely when I was a child. Then not long after my Uncle Joseph passed away, Maxie disappeared, we never saw him again. And then after so many years, he paid my mother a visit once. He knew he was dying, I don't know if it was cancer or whatever. And he came to, you know, say goodbye to the family that he neglected for so long. And I remember my brother Michael was very upset. He's like, uh, he came just to die, get my mother all upset and sad and, and sure enough, not long after that, he did, he did die. Now notice with him, I say he died. Everyone else I say passed away. He was dead even when he was al alive. And to this day, whenever anyone neglects their family, I say he's, he's, he's doing a maxi, he's, he's pulling a maxi. 
All right, well, this is the spot where Sally Vigorigo used to sit. He'd be sitting right here, the edge of the bar, by the window. He was kind of like the official lookout. You know, he'd always be looking out the window. If he saw somebody he didn't know, he was like, hey, who's this fucking guy? This guy from the neighborhood? You know this fucking guy? Who's this fucking guy? Hey, who's, hey, come here. You know this fucking guy? Who's that fucking guy? Yeah. <laughs>